Good morning. We have Justice Kevin Doherty here with us today. Good morning, Len. How are you? Uh, very well, thank you. And I'm really happy that you're here to help us with this project. It's always my pleasure. Okay, that's great. Um, we're starting out at the beginning. So, where would uh, can you tell us about your background, where you were born, where you grew up? Sure. I'm a Philadelphia born and raised kid. Grew up in South Philadelphia mm -hmm. in an area called Second Street. Great story. Two Street. Two Street. Yeah. The great story is that when my mother's family came from County Cork, Ireland, they literally got off the boat at Delaware and Market Street. <laughs> and they walked up a couple blocks and they were sent to the Irish ghetto, the Irish Catholic ghetto, which uh, was then South Philadelphia. Okay. And a uh, hundred and some years later, my family's still located there. <laughs> yeah. It's just not a ghetto right now. It's uh, a yeah. loving neighborhood where the homes are selling for two, three hundred thousand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Times have changed. Yes, yeah. well, certainly. But, you know, that neighborhood feel of South Philadelphia, people don't want to move away because they'll lose all that. Uh, I agree. It's generational. Yeah. I Although I, I did. I emigrated to the Northeast. Well, you know, it's not too far, no. to tell you the truth. Um, what about uh, uh, your early career as a lawyer? What did you do before you became a judge? I spent five years as an assistant uh, district attorney here in the city and county okay. of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Thereafter, I opened up my own business with Steve Marino, um, my best buddy from the DA's office. Yeah. And we had our own practice, Marino and Doherty, for about five years. And just when I was on that cusp of doing really well, yeah. I had an opportunity to run for judge. <laughs> So you switched out. You were just I, about seeing over the hill. I huh? did. <laughs> Typically, I chose public service over wealth. Yeah, well, <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> well, what? Uh, how did it happen with you being elected judge? I mean, you you uh, expressed an interest, and a lot of people don't know how that all works. Realistically, yeah. I never wanted to be a judge. It was yeah. just a great opportunity. I noticed through my career. I guess growing up in South Philadelphia, I was inspired to be a judge because I happened to see what life was like for the normal uh, lower middle class mm -hmm. Philadelphian. Yeah. You know, I used to sit around and watch everybody's father go off to Longshore, get a city job, or be a police officer or a firefighter. <laughs> Moms tried to stay home or had part-time jobs. But I also saw, that was the upside, I also saw the downside that when dad was injured yeah. and the family didn't have uh, any income coming in. They were too proud to collect public assistance, okay. and I watched houses going foreclosure. I watched different mm. things like that, mm. that nature. Um, kind of inspired me yeah. because I didn't grow up with lawyers. I didn't grow up with doctors. Right. I grew up with blue collar, yeah. hard working, at, at, you know, with a good working ethic. Um, that inspired me to be a lawyer, mm. to get out there and help. I think that was my civil. Uh, Duty. Well, yeah, so you had to answer. Right, so you know, I aspired to be a DA because I thought that would be the right thing to do yeah. to protect the community. And then thereafter, I became a defense attorney. I did criminal defense and family court. Mm. Um, and it brought in my experiences. But I was able to give back to the community. Mm -hmm. So the year was around 2001 when there were 33 lawyers fighting for 11 positions on the Court of Common Pleas okay. bench. Um, I had the good fortune of having my brother as the treasurer of the Democratic Party of Philadelphia at the time. <laughs> yeah. It's always a plus. Yes. Um, I had horrible ballot position. I used to tell everybody, out of 33 lawyers, I was number 24. <laughs> and my, my, my comment was, um, difficult to find, but worth the look. <laughs> yes, okay, good. And I did really well. Uh, won the primary, and thereafter, Governor Tom Ridge appointed me along with three others. Uh -huh. the court. So I got appointed in June of that year. Yeah. And then subsequently in November we got elected and I sat. I see how, because I read how that you had been appointed and then elected in the Correct. same year. Correct. <clears throat> so I, I had good fortunes that way and I remember coming in to this, this room actually yeah. meeting with the president, judge, and all the administrative judges and based upon my experience they thought they were going to assign me to the criminal division. Yeah. I requested the family division. Again, answering that uh, call to try to help families and kids. And yeah, I, I should say my experience had been as a district attorney, I prosecuted juveniles and mm -hmm. I was in what's called the Habitual Offenders Unit. Okay. Thereafter, Judge Panapinto was the administrative judge of the family court. Mm -hmm. And in 1998, he appointed me 
Carol Carson and John Irvine, who's now a judge. And interesting, Carol Carson is a master hearing officer in the family court. Uh -huh. We were the three original masters in truancy. Okay. And I had the Kensington area. All right. Now that's a that program. I'm interested in that. What what happened in that program? How did it work? What had happened is I would handle all the kids coming out of that east area. Mm -hmm. And the truth was, we didn't know how to handle them. So my job was to try to reach out to the various community organizations, uh -huh. Concilio, Congresso, Espira, mm -hmm. because I had a primarily Spanish-speaking population. And my job was to inquire as to what services I can bring to our kids in the courtroom. Yeah. And as a master, we had to review them, try to dig down and find out what was the base for their truancy. Was okay. it, was it a, a, a lack of parental guidance, care, or control? Was it just uh, some learning disability and mm. embarrassment to go to school? Which it can be sometimes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, I, I, I did that for several years. And then when I became a judge in family court, mm. I went to the administrative judges back then. It was Esther Sylvester, then Myrna Field. And I asked them if I could handle the truancy project. Mm -hmm. Okay. And interestingly, in the law, truancy can be treated as quasi-criminal because we can subject you to a fine oh. and/or incarceration. Yeah, I didn't know that. It, it, well, we don't do that in Philadelphia. Okay. And that was the beauty of it. I was able to start creating the program, and then, with the good blessings of the Supreme Court, when I became administrative judge, I instituted a policy change that oh. we we're going to treat it as a dependency issue. Okay. And as a, uh, so that social services needed to be more involved, not incarceration. Yeah. I wasn't going to find my parents because, as you know, Philadelphia is what, we're the largest, poorest Poor city. city. yeah. So why would I create debtor's court? Exactly. So I, I didn't believe in and that. And you won't get anything thing. out of it anyway. Yeah, and we're not getting our children educated. My yeah. job was make sure our kids get a free and appropriate education. Right, bottom line. That's, that's it. it. Yeah. Well, that, I, that's all admirable to me. I mean, I really like that. As you know, I worked in juvenile court for a while. And I really like the idea that uh, somebody like you, high profile, can, you know, definitely uh, dedicate themselves to helping out with uh, juveniles in the city and, and the I, family. I spent the 90% the of my career, 99% of my career in family. Mm -hmm. And that was by design. Okay. I can remember... When I first got elected to the bench and um, requested family court, I can remember eyes being raised and brows <laughs> being lifted as to why do you want to do that? Why would you waste your talents? And the judges back then, unfortunately, were more seasoned judges <laughs> yes. waiting for retirement. Well, or, or God forbid, <laughs> um, they were fell in someone's disfavor and they were kind of banished. <laughs> And I didn't like the concept that our judges weren't worthy and that our lawyers were the lawyers who can practice well so they yeah. were sent to family court. That's a fallacy. Yeah. To me, the most important court is family court. You're dealing with delinquency and dependency and termination of parental rights. And also, we deal with domestic relations, custody right. support, protection from abuse. We transcend race, gender, religion. Everything. I think. Everybody yeah. walks through our court. Yeah. That's where everything begins, too, with a lot of fans. And, and I, like as I said, I, I, I was blessed to be appointed as the administrative judge mm -hmm. in 2004. Actually, Judge Myrna Field appointed me supervising judge in 03. So I had a okay. really good run of it. I get elected in 01, and I begin leadership in 03 and mm -hmm. remain in leadership okay. to my departure. Right. But as the administrative judge, I, I like that because we're able to establish policy. I mm -hmm. can really create. Yeah. And my job was to turn that feeling and make family court a destination of success, not only for the kids, but for our judges. And one of the first things I did was I tried to recruit judges who were more reflective of our community. The majority of my children are children of color. Right. Yet we had a dearth of judges of color. Ah, uh, I see. Uh, we've always had Judge Reynolds, who's an institution, right. an icon. Yes. <laughs> Courtroom D. Courtroom D. Um, <laughs> And he was a mentor to me, as was Judge Cipriani. And what a wonderful guy he was. Loved the man. Yeah. However, um, we were able to recruit those judges. Uh -huh. And then, as time went on, I had the good fortune of reaching out to Judge Dan Anders and Judge Ann Butcher, who were the first openly elected gay, gay. judges. Right. And we had a uh, the new generation of using Judge Lisa Rochette's term, throwaway kids, and they were uh -huh. our LGBT community. 
okay. particularly transgender. Yeah. Uh, and that was before we even had the real term transgender. Right. Yeah, right. So I was able to seek their advice, help, and ultimately recruit them to family court mm -hmm. so that we as a community of judges would best meet the needs of our community of kids. I think it's excellent. I loved it. Yeah. And then the best part is now my ju now the judges don't want to leave. They want to stay in family court. So <laughs> I think we've created a, a nice environment. Yes, you have, definitely. And uh, definitely changed the outlook toward family court. Yeah, I, I hope so. Plus, you got a, there was a big new building put up for the family uh, court, right? Yeah, I had the good fortune of having Chief Justice Castile permit uh, Judge Terry Murphy, the supervising judge, now yeah. administrative judge, and I yeah. would um, endlessly prepare <laughs> yes. for that court. Yeah. We were uh, ordained with the responsibility of developing the interior. Mm -hmm. So okay. we had to pick out the chairs, the carpet, the wallpaper. <laughs> She and I have gone all the way out to the 30th Street station to sit on chairs and to see which them. one to test them to yes. see what was good right. for our waiting room. But she wanted to make sure that they're comfortable. Yeah, well, it would be better than those wooden benches we used to uh, deal with. Everything. And I didn't need any profanity carved into them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Dockery is, I didn't like that. <laughs> there might have been a couple of references to myself over there, I don't know. Um, now, uh, after you uh, became a, a supervising judge and then an administrative judge, then you were elected to the Supreme Court. Correct. And uh, what's going on there? Um, <laughs> work, can you say? I don't know. Well, yeah, well, we handle all the necessary cases that come up to us on Alicotter. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, the image of the Supreme Court is is really not portrayed as it, uh, how do I say this? I think people have this impression that the Supreme Court, because we sit only six times a year, isn't yeah. a hard working court. Right, okay. That is absolutely a, a, a false statement. Again, an image problem. It's an image problem. Yeah. And I think we're hoping to have more transparency and uh, mm -hmm. open our court to the light. For example, People don't realize that there's seven justices. When I first got on the court, we were only five we were oh, down. Okay. And each year, there's about three thousand allocators, which are requests from wow. parties to accept, have their case accepted by us. Right. So each justice has to receive the docket, which may be a box of sure. briefs. Yeah. We have to read them and then prepare a report determining whether we should accept it or not and what the constitutional issues or non-constitutional issues are. After we prepare them and write them, we have to disseminate them to my colleagues. Yeah. And they, with theirs, to us. Okay. So these are all going around Constantly. and spreading from one person. Then you're preparing for cases, yeah. and then you have to prepare and read, and then while you're preparing for reading, yeah. you're also trying to write the matters sure. that you've already heard. So yes. it's a constant flux. Now, the upside is I'm constantly learning, I'm constantly busy. Yeah. Uh, busy. Okay. The downside is, it, it, with my personality, I miss being in the courtroom. I miss handling okay. the children and families in front of me. I miss yeah. having that impact. Now we have a global impact, or at least a commonwealth-wide impact. Yeah, that's true. I kind of enjoyed the fact that, as a defense attorney, I protected the defendant's rights. As a district attorney, I protected the community, mm -hmm. or at least that small community. When I did family law, I helped an individual family, and when I um, did civil law, I either got your money or I didn't. <laughs> but in juvenile law, you're not only helping that child, you're helping generations. Right. Because once we end that cycle of a lack of education and maybe give you the tools that work you out of poverty, then we're breaking that. Okay. That's something you're never going to get. Now, I transcend that to the Supreme Court by saying, at least the cases that we're making, I try to bring the practical application of how is this really going to work in that courtroom. Okay. Being a trial lawyer and a trial judge before I uh, right. was elected to the yeah. an appellate bench, um, my fear was, hey, I know that I can do this, but I've never done it. Yeah. <laughs> the beauty of not doing it is now I know how to do it, and yeah. I can make sure that my colleagues 
are understanding that their decisions will have an incredible impact in that courtroom for that judge. Yeah, of course. So I think we have, a, 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 a like I said, a commonwealth-wide impact. So that, that keeps me going. Oh, that's good. I mean, and it is true. Um, I, and I think the idea that you started out with also with the, uh, the children stopping a, a downward uh, trend, helping the family, and that also helped the community. Absolutely. Uh, as a whole. So now you're working with the community or the state level and you got a whole lot of responsibility now. And work apparently. You ever sleep? What's going on? <laughs> on occasion. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, uh, do you have any advice that you'd like to give to uh, judges who are just starting out? Listen, as an attorney, you're constantly taught to argue. Mm. When we're in the courtroom, while opposing counsels making their argument or questioning, we have been trained to think of a question, being prepared in, uh, in rebuttal or in response. But I've learned that the judge needs to learn to listen. Okay. More importantly, a judge should not be an adversary. Mm. I've stood in front of judges. Who have taken positions against okay. my position or yeah. I should say for either the Commonwealth or for the defense or in another position yeah. and I found that some were trying <laughs> to be battling to counsel okay and uh, sometimes I think in the quest to do the right thing they become a little more advocate than referee okay so I would surely advise all the new judges listen be conscious of your acts and your questions. We have a right to ask questions. Without a doubt, I did. Yeah. But don't become an advocate and choose a side and assist the party you find in your favor but doesn't apparently appear to be winning. Yeah, okay. I also believe judges should lean on other judges. In what way? My greatest asset was that if I had a matter in a courtroom that I didn't know how to handle, Yeah. I could put the matter on hold and pick up the phone and oh, speak to another judge. Right. Um, just to get their understanding of what the procedure of the form is. Yeah. Did they ever handle this type of motion? And mm -hmm. what am I looking for? I think that's great. Um, we have a wealth of knowledge in the first judicial district. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I well, I, I remember that yesterday when we were or a previous interview. Uh, another uh, justice, as a matter of fact, said, "If you don't know, you call up somebody, and you and you know another judge." Or, and so you're talking about getting all the right information from almost everybody, absolutely, in order to move forward, you know, sensibly. So remember, we're all human. Mm -hmm. I know that I don't know everything, <laughs> and a wise man knows that. So. Um, do you think, were there any big cases that you were involved in or were there, did you have any uh, sort of idols or people that you looked up to when you were coming up? I had a lot of cases. Probably the most sensationalized case was when I handled what we were calling the flash mob cases. Mm -hmm. Oh. Random flocks of juveniles were running through Center City, yeah. causing havoc, throwing seniors in front of cars, uh -huh. breaking windows, trashing Wanamaker's. And it was a long, uh, drawn-out experience, mm -hmm. um, and I handled the cases, and I determined who was guilty and not, and who was in need of treatment supervision, and I determined who needed to be put away. My job is separate the good kid who got caught up in a bad way yeah. by putting away the bad kid that needs to be there okay. and not apologizing for either. No, I remember that philosophy. And as, as a result, I'd have to say um, we ended flash mops for a period of time, and we were fearing that it would be a growing trend and I was working with the mayor and the police commissioner. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, uh, we haven't had any large incident like that since. Because they were breeding with one another. There was another, there was a flash mob and then before you'd know it, there would be another one. Correct. And it was all organized through the internet, I Correct. think, right? I remember and it was that. just violent. Yeah. It's kind of nasty, isn't it? Well, it's sad. Yeah. But the beauty was, um, in family court, I was ready for them. How about it? Good. And we sent the message that we don't perform like this in a civilized society. Right. My comment used to be, today you have a right to get up, but you're choosing 
eat what you want, wear what you want, but should you commit a crime and I place you, oh, you wrong. do what I tell you, <laughs> yes. you wear what I let you, and you get home when I decide. Right. We're up to me. I prefer not to have some strange man yeah. take the, 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 the requirements of my life. I yeah. have to do it. And tell me what to do. But it's always, there's some consequences for your conduct and just not going to tolerate violence. I, you know, I used to say something like that, akin to that, uh, to uh, some of the probationers I had when mm -hmm. I was working out in uh, West Philadelphia. Um, do you, have you noticed any now any change in the, uh, the courtroom or uh, in the practice of law from when you began to how it is now? There's slight changes outside the the modernization of the courtroom. Yeah, um, I can. I remember the days when well, you were right in on that. I, right, I can remember trying criminal cases here in City Hall as opposed to the Groom of Justice Center, and I can remember standing outside the courtrooms and people smoking cigarettes. Yeah, right. Or having a conference in the back and the judge smoking cigarettes, and yeah. that that's a long <laughs> gone period of time. I remember. Um, hearing the rumors that one judge would keep an, uh, his dog in the courtroom. <laughs> we don't have those anymore. But as for the actual practice of law, it, it's terrible to say, but maybe it's just when you think back of old times and you, you, you kind of gloss it over as the good old days. Yeah. I, I felt as if lawyers were, there was more camaraderie. There wasn't this animosity or this personal approach to lawyering. Yeah, there seems to be, a, everybody seems to uh, be a, a little more aggressive these days. Yeah, and you could be aggressive. I was an aggressive prosecutor. I was an aggressive or passionate defense attorney. But right. we had a job to do. Okay. And then when I walked out of the courtroom, whether whichever side I stood, yeah. I was friendly with opposing counsel. And it was nothing like fighting in uh, to a jury and then going on having a cup of coffee or grabbing a beer with your right. you know, with your uh, okay. adversary. Yeah. Well, I, I, I just don't see that as much these days. Okay. That's interesting too. Um, is there is there anything else that you'd like to share with us today, Mr. Justice? <laughs> no, just that I was a lawyer that was lucky when <laughs> And I've been blessed to be here in the First Judicial District. I, I, look, I have a soft spot, one for family court. Yeah. But more so, even as a state justice, I get an opportunity to travel the state. But as uh, Dorothy said, there's no place like home. Yeah. And home is glad that you're around. Hey, thanks, sir. Thanks a lot, Mr. Johnson.